Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, it's Creepy Pasta Thursday, and I have three stories in this episode for you. Andrew Pendragon pens the tale Candles to start things off. Then weirdo family member Randy Hogan shared a fictional tale called Old Woman in the Window. And then our final story is one from S.F. Barkley called I'm a Cop and I Institutionalized Someone I Knew Wasn't Crazy. While listening, be sure to check out the Weird Darkness website. At WeirdDarkness.com you can sign up for the newsletter, watch old horror movies, plus you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. inherited Chandler's candles from my pa, who had inherited it from his grandma, who inherited it, I, I guess, from her ma or pa. It's a dying art, honestly, and I'll be the first to admit that. Artisan candles can be costly, and most potential patrons would much rather just run down to the supermarket and get one for a couple of bucks, if that. I still do it, though. I slave over hot wax and oils tirelessly you get lost in it, you see? Sometimes I peer into my cauldron and I feel like I can see all the different forms it might take. There's a reason why candles are a spiritual item for a lot of people. In fact, most of my profit is made off of the Catholic Church down the road. I get a call about every month requesting another crate of prayer, pillar, and taper candles. Somewhere in the order, there's always a request for a vanilla-scented, sculpted candle. That's my favorite. They never really detail the style they want, usually just saying, use your imagination. And I do. I spend more time on that one novelty sculpt than I do on all the other candles in the order combined. I use white as a base, but as the candle grows in layers, I'll add greens and blues and sometimes reds. While the wax is still warm, I cut it with my tools. As silly as it sounds, I put a lot of myself into those cuts. Curls and peels, birds, flowers, leaves, and petals. When I'm feeling especially crafty, I'll sculpt the image of a saint, usually Mother Mary or Saint Peter. I like sculpting faces. I know I've done it right when I feel like it can actually see me. I like faces. The sign hanging in my window says, Open 1-7 to seven Tuesday through Friday, 11-8 to eight Saturday, closed Sunday and Monday. This is only partially true because my favorite clients come after hours exclusively, when the moon is high and the streets are hushed. I only ever see them once, but that's not such a bad thing. I miss them, yes, because they tell me stories. Sad stories, usually, but special nonetheless. You know what's strange, though? The happy stories, the ones that make me laugh or smile, those stories are the ones I typically find the saddest in the end. Once a young man told me a story about his dog, Clementine. He told me the story of the time they got lost in the woods one winter. His parents had told him to not be gone for long because of the bitter cold winds, and he promised to be back after dark. All evening, 
the young man and his dog Clementine played in the drifts of snow. They dug tunnels and even made a snowman. He tossed packed balls of snow into the air and Clementine would leap after them, catching them in her teeth. In all of the fun, the young man lost track of time and space. He wandered in the direction that he believed his home should be, but only managed to get more disoriented in the forest that he had known all his life. The snow had masked all the telltale landmarks that usually guided him. The boulder that looked like a face, the fallen oak tree, the mushroom-capped stump. After hours of searching, he sat down to cry until his eyes grew heavy and he fell into a deep sleep. He told me he was grateful that Clementine found her way back home, though. She helped his parents find his body later that morning. I gave that man the brightest, prettiest candle I had in the shop at that time. I know, I know, it guided his way through that frozen night. But as I watched the pale aura of his iridescent glow get swallowed up into the dark, I believe in my heart of hearts that nothing could even come close as long as he held his brave little candle. I didn't open up the shop that next morning. I had too much to consider. While I could fill countless pages with stories from my time at the shop, I'd like to tell you a story that happened just yesterday. It was a Tuesday, and Clovetown was sleepy. The chill that ran through the streets warded most from leaving their homes that day, and I thought it fit to make some apple cider-scented fills in hopes of coaxing out some patrons with their alluring scent. Fills take less time than dipped candles, so I can sell them for much cheaper, another alluring quality. While I waited for the wax to fully melt, I sat with a warm cup of tea, feeling quite clever. My entrance bell rang, and I headed for the counter. A man stood there, muddy and shivering. "'Come in, come in,' I plead you are soaking wet. He looked at me a little stunned as I guided him into his seat. Gee, you're freezing. I'll get you some tea. He blinks. Thank you, sir. I scurry to a kettle that sat on the stove and pour the liquid into a glass jar that would normally have been used for fills. I apologize for the container as I pass it off to him. It's not a problem. It's uh, thank you again. And he smiles folding deep laugh lines along his aged face. Not a problem at all, I say, and I notice a bruise on his head. Do you need something for that? He taps the yellow blemish and winces. No, just a bruise. Are you okay? Was there an accident? Shaking his head, he takes a sip of tea. No, well, yes, sorry. Yes, I'm okay, and no, there wasn't an accident. Just some local kids having a laugh. A laugh at you? He shrugs. I've been around long enough to not care so much. Kids can be cruel, but old men are calloused. He chuckles, then sucks on his teeth. An anger burns in my stomach. That won't do. It, it's, it, it's, it was a rock, a small one at that. I just bruise easy. There's a warmth in his tone that soothes my anger. I tell him that he can stay as long as he wishes and that I could even get him a bite to eat as well. I assumed him a vagrant, not by the state of his clothes, but by the character of his face. It told its own story of a home far, far away. You make candles, he chimes, breaking me from the well of my thoughts. I do indeed. I take a sculpt off a nearby shelf and place it in his hands. I thought I must be by a bakery. I smelled apple pie, he says holding the candle beneath his nose. "'Apple cider, actually,' I tell him. "'I haven't seen you before. Are you from around here?' He laughs again. "'No, not here. Out west, but I haven't been there in a long time. Are you staying in Clovetown?' His brow furrows into a delicate arch. Oh, "'For now, but I'll be gone before long.' Topping off his jar with the last of the kettle. "'Passing through, huh?' I'm always passing through somewhere. We all are, I guess. Passing through this year or this place, passing by this person and that. Passing by, passing by. He swirls the tea. My heart beats softly. Where will you be passing by next? His smile returns. Wherever I please. 
<laughs> that's the fun of it. No sense getting blue about all the things you pass by. If you don't, it will. Well, I'm glad you hadn't passed me by. I may not have had any other company all day. The two of us chatted about places and people for hours, and noticing that no work would actually get done or needed to be done, I flick off the heat from my cauldron and leave it for another day. I notice, however, that the cauldron is already cold and the wax stiff. At some point, the power had gone out, with either of us noticing since I usually illuminate my workspace with scrap candles that I don't think will sell. This worries me a little, and before long I've already forgotten. In time, I learned that his name is Bassam and that his family had come from Israel before settling down in a Midwestern state that he wished not to discuss. I asked him if he had any siblings, but he'd only say, not anymore, that they'd already passed by. Bassam seems light, despite his melancholy demeanor. He always looks thoughtfully lost in some rumination. He pauses before he speaks, he nods before he stands, everything with the slightest of grins. The sun was setting on our day when he mentions that he should be going, passing by. You're free to stay the night, I tell him, trying to not scare him with too much sincerity. It's fine, he says. There's still much to see and many miles to go. Well, where will you go now? Perhaps southward, he mumbles while scratching his stubble. Uh, perhaps not. I notice that he's been holding that sculpted candle the entirety of his stay when he goes back to set it on the shelf. Ah, keep it, I said, and I hand him a box of matches from a drawer behind my desk. It's awful cold, plus you remind me of it. It'd be too sad to look at it sitting alone now on display, reminding me of the kind stranger that stopped by one day. He inspects it with clear eyes. Reminds you, eh? With a little attention, it'll burn brightly for a very long time. I couldn't sell it to anyone at this point, as it seems to have been meant for you. I had originally fashioned it for the church down the street, but they sent it back, saying that they couldn't fit another one. Their stores were still full from their previous order, so it sat up there on its perch waiting for someone who needed a little light. He slides the matches into his pocket and I wrap the candle in tissue, then plastic wrap. I take some twine and a tag, knotting it around the gift. On it I write, thank you for passing by. Sincerely, John. He thanks me and stares at the present for a long while. I give him his time, saying nothing. Bassam leaves with a wave and another smile. The bell rings above the door and he's gone. The rest of the day is occupied with cleaning and inventory. I'm acutely aware of my passing by each and every article of my wares. I feel like I should greet them, or maybe that I should tell them goodbye as I go. I laugh when I catch myself saying, excuse me, after bumping into a table. Every once in a while, I consider going out for a drink or a bite to eat, but my shop is the coziest place on earth and it's nearly impossible to leave once it has you bundled in its array of sights and smells. When closing time comes, I drift to the window to shut the curtains for the night, ready for my more transient clients, should they choose to come. Just as I arrive at the window, it shatters. The shards fly through the air like the dusting of snow that's beginning to fall and I hear a scream. Run! I hear. I throw my head out through the place where my window had once been. Three kids are rushing down the street as fast as their feet can carry them. That concerns me little, though. On a bench just to my left, out of my line of sight from most of the shop, sits Bassam. The wind moans through the surrounding alleyways, and I hope that he simply just can't hear me yelling for him. I don't even put on my coat before running to the bench, through the snow and slush. I reach for the man when I arrive, but he is stiff. On and around the bench are stones, healed from cruel children who don't know that sticks and stones hurt more than just bones. I find the strength to drag his nearly frozen body off his seat down the sidewalk and into my shop. His breathing is shallow, and his mouth quivers, forming specters of words. I lay him on the floor and rush for a blanket to throw over him. It's dark, and the violent gale snuffs out the candlelight that normally nests safely inside. 
I'm attempting to wrap him in the cover, but he is rigid. His breath no longer clouds the air about his face. His lips stand still. His frozen hands are weaved tightly around his candle that he holds to his chest. And I know he is gone. They know he is gone, too. They always know. I pry the candle from his hands and use the matches in his pocket to light the wick. But the storm catches the tiny flame. It disappears, leaving behind a thin string of smoke. I strike another match and light the wick again, this time shielding it with my whole body. I can hear them slinking outside. They groan painfully and sometimes shriek without warning. I focus on the tiny, helpless flame as it holds tightly to its mooring. Please, I beg. But they'd already found us. Their feet crunch on the broken glass as they surmount the window. The illumination that usually guarded the shop and drew in my wayward clients was gone. Well, mostly gone. We still had that single, tiny, courageous fire that could barely light even a small area around us. But it would work. It had to work. My patrons are mine and no others. My family had harbored them for centuries, giving them, as best we could, the tools to brave the darkest of nights. That night was no different. It didn't take them long to descend upon us, filling the shop from wall to wall. Give him over, they whispered. He has already been marked. I bare my teeth. No, I growl like a feral hound. Mine! Their tongues lap against the ground impatiently. They pace the perimeter of our tiny fortress in one formless mass. More emerge from the dark corners of the workshop as if the night itself was bleeding. Their threats, their demands, all of it was meaningless as long as I could guard that flame. Once during that night, another patron knocked upon my door, looking for a safe harbor just as so many had done before. I didn't even see their face. The night flooded out the window and devoured them before they could even scream. Cracks and crunches, tearing, rending and breaking. I didn't even get to see their face. I blamed myself, obviously, and still do. But when they had their fill, they came back as expected. Some ventured a taloned hand into the glow, but quickly retreated with a string of screeches and curses. Please, they begged in unison. We starve. We hunger. He's mine, I yell again, and my heart nearly stops as I watch my breath threaten the flame. I try to remember the prayers that I had heard from the sisters, but they escaped me. I could only whisper a prayer of my own. He's mine. He's mine. He's mine. Over and over, through the deathly hours of that long night, the damned mocked me. They pulled at my boots and tugged my hair. You will be soon. The light will go out. Go out. You will die, then you will be ours. Spare him to us, and we will spare you. He's mine. He's mine. He's mine. The man you called Father, we remember. The car, the smoke, we remember. He squealed for mercy. He cried out your name when we found him. Did you know that? He is one of us. We are him. He is us. He is here. He's mine. He's mine. I clutch my eyes as tight as I can. The night has eyes that even you cannot see. We are never filled. We wait on your doorstep and you steal from us. You steal. You will be a feast. A feast. He's mine. Then all was still. Still as an open grave. And I dare a slivered peak. The first crepuscular rays of morning peered over the horizon and through the phalanx of clouds above. The night was gone slithered away into whatever darkened pit that would permit them. A winter breeze quietly shushed the curtain windows in front of me. The tiny candle, half spent, had conquered the deathly howls of the night. I could see its weak glow still waving at me proudly. 
Was I brave? It asked me in its silent flickers. You were so brave. I hold it up into the wind, and a tail of smoke passes by. The Old Woman in the Window by Weirdo Family Member Randy Hogan I can't tell you exactly when I first noticed the old woman staring at me through my bedroom window, but the moment I saw her, my life would become a nightmare. The thought of an old woman staring at you through your bedroom window sounds more like a silly joke instead of a terrifying experience. But when you take into account that I lived in a two-story house with my bedroom being in the second floor and there was no ledge or balcony for anyone, let alone a frail old woman, to get a grip on to make it to my window, and the expression on the old woman's face was the most dead, emotionless, blank expression I have ever seen on someone's face, it was like she wasn't even looking at me but just staring straight through me with a, a sad, death-like aura. When I told my best friend the next day at school, he replied like any normal boy in high school, told me that she probably wanted my goodies, and I laughed it off since I would have said the same thing if the situation was the other way around, but soon the old woman was appearing in my window every night. Sometimes I'd fall asleep without seeing her, and only awake a couple hours later to her ghostly gaze. But the encounters seemed to follow a rule, a set or pattern, as she would only appear after 10.30, no earlier, and in a weird way that gave me comfort as I could schedule around the odd specter. However, just as I seemed to be able to tune out the weird experience, the pattern began to become irrational and seemed to be much more random. For example, I began seeing the old woman in my living room window during broad daylight, and then things got even extra creepy when she began appearing inside the house and in a few horrifying encounters even sat down next to me with that ghastly expression still cemented on her face. It's been eight months of increasing appearances, and yet the most terrifying thing of this whole ordeal has just started happening. Every time the old woman would appear, a new figure would also appear. This one was a shadow person with manly features, and he too has begun to come closer, and I feel an uneasy feeling every time he gets closer, and the worst part is that now the shadow man had given the old woman a new expression, one of pure horror and terror, and to my great dismay both figures now appear within inches of me. I'm not sure what tomorrow night will bring, if there is a tomorrow night. Creepypasta Thursday continues in just a moment with our third and final story when Weird Darkness returns. Morning. The language in this last story is pretty coarse, using a lot of words I don't normally use in the podcast. But I've decided to leave the words as they were written, keeping the author's intent in place, and I also think that they add credence to the characters involved. So parental discretion is strongly advised. I'm a cop, and I institutionalized someone I knew wasn't crazy by S. F. Barkley. 
For those of you that don't know me, my name is Sean Barkley. I'm a cop in a small, rural Pennsylvania town currently stuck working the night shift. I work with a lot of older guys, so they tend to treat me like a rookie, even though I have been on for a couple years now. I work your normal patrol shift, driving around, pulling traffic, responding to your usual domestic disputes and whatever other wonderful calls dispatch sends my way. There have been a lot of unexplainable calls that I've responded to in this town. There are certain things that they just can't prepare you for in the police academy and, well, this was one of those situations. I walked out of our local 24-hour gas station with a hot cup of coffee and I rushed to my cruiser, doing my best to avoid the freezing rain. The weather has been absolutely miserable here lately. You'd think January meant snow, but no. Instead, we get freezing rain and heavy winds. I shook off the rain and held my coffee with both of my hands to warm up. It was the first time I got to sit down after I spent the first two hours of my shift directing traffic due to one of the lights at the main intersection going out. And right as I feel that I'm finally warming up, dispatch ruined the moment. Dispatch to 1034. Damn. It's like dispatch has some kind of radar and can sense the worst time to send me a call. <sighs> 1034, go ahead, I moaned into the microphone. Please respond to, extracted, to speak with a male who called 911 saying that he witnessed a murder. The call taker believes that the male might be mentally ill. 1034, show me en route. I felt my phone almost immediately buzz. It was Tracy, the dispatcher. Hey, Sean, I'm sorry to send you to this call. I know you just got done with the traffic detail, but you're the only CIT officer on right now. As much as I complain about dispatch, I have a good relationship with each of the individual dispatchers. Plus, Tracy was right, I was the only CIT officer working last night. By the way, CIT stands for Crisis Intervention Team, and I attended several weeks of training learning how to interact with individuals who have a mental illness or intellectual disability. As I previously mentioned, this is a rural town, so most people live on farms around here. I could barely see the street sign through the rain, but I found it and I turned down the muddy path. After about a mile, I saw the address dispatch told me. I parked a little past the house and shut off my lights and engine. I watched the residents for a moment and, although I couldn't see very clearly, I saw a flash of light from the upstairs window. I expected to simultaneously hear a gunshot because it looked almost exactly like a muzzle flash, but no sound followed the light. What the hell was that? Hmm, must have been a flashlight. I got out of the cruiser and walked up to the house. I knocked on the front door and announced myself. Police! Please come to the front door! The wind was so loud I nearly had my ear against the door to listen to what was going on inside. Finally, a male opened the door. He was lanky. His face was dusted with blonde scruff. His hair was disheveled and he was wearing a pair of jeans and an old shirt. Thank God you're here. Um, Officer Barkley, what's going on here? His eyebrows raised, and he combed his fingers through his hair as he thought. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Can you can you please come inside so we can talk? I cautiously entered his home and watched as he paced across his family room floor. The old farmhouse had its original hardwood flooring that creaked with every step he took. I started the conversation. You told the call taker that you witnessed a murder? Do you want to go into more details about that?" He stopped pacing and looked right at me. His eyes were cold and gray, and I felt chills down my spine as he stared. Yeah, I don't expect you to believe me, but please, just hear me out. I swear I'm not crazy. Telling somebody you're not crazy doesn't really help them think that you're not crazy. I nodded my head and let him continue. All right, uh, where to start? He looked around the room as if he was literally looking for a place to start. My name is Kevin. My sister is Melissa. Well, was. I don't even know now. Kevin grabbed his hair and pulled it as he sat down. He was showing signs of mania. All right, so so anyway, as I was saying, my sister was Melissa Watson. She died about five years ago, and I know who killed her started taking notes because I knew that I'd need to disprove his claims with facts to explain in my report why I believed he was mentally ill. 
I asked, where was he killed? If he says it was in our town, it would be easy for me to check. Here, in this house. She used to live here with her husband, and she was found dead, and they ruled it as a suicide, saying she shot herself. Kevin started frantically shaking his head back and forth and became visibly upset. His voice shook as he continued, but it wasn't suicide. Her husband killed her. Holy crap. I actually remembered there being a case exactly what he was describing. It was before I started as a cop, but I definitely heard about it, being that it is a pretty small town. Even the name now started to ring a bell. I cautiously thought about what to say next. How do you know her husband killed her? I saw it. Well, if you saw it all those years ago, why are you just now reporting it? Kevin's eyes welled up with tears. I, I didn't see it back then. I, I just saw it this week, and now I can't stop seeing it. What do you mean you just saw it this week? He slowly raised his pointing finger and pointed up. In the bedroom, uh, upstairs. Every time I walk by the room, I see her standing in there pleading for her life, and then I see her husband pull the trigger. It's like a memory that plays in front of my eyes. I can't audibly hear her talking, but I can hear it in my mind like I just know. If you don't find her husband, I'll go hunt him down myself and find justice. Kevin, do you understand that what you see isn't really happening? You even told me yourself that your sister died years ago, so how can you see it happening again? Kevin stood up and grew louder. I'm not crazy! He started pacing again. It started with the flash of light. Every time I looked in the room, I'd see that muzzle flash. Over time, the uh, uh, visions, I don't know what else to call it, they grew more vivid. And then I finally saw the face behind the gun. I know he killed her. The muzzle flash. My mind shot back to when I first arrived on the scene and saw that flash of light in the window upstairs. What the hell was I supposed to do with this information? How could I possibly use anything Kevin was saying as evidence? I knew this was going to become a mess of a case, but I also heard Kevin threaten to kill Melissa's husband if I didn't do anything about it. The only way to keep everybody safe was to commit Kevin due to the fact that he was a danger to other people. But that doesn't mean that I actually thought he was crazy. I don't know what the hell I believed. I placed Kevin in handcuffs and advised dispatch. 1034 to dispatch. Go ahead. Show me en route to Psyche with an involuntary 302. 10-4. As we walked outside to my cruiser in the pouring rain, Kevin yelled over the roaring winds. Look! I turned around and looked up at the second floor window. Flash. And then I saw a faint image of a woman fall to the floor. I blinked, and she was gone. You saw it! Didn't you? I sat in my cruiser, staring at my steering wheel. What the hell did I just see? It was at this very moment that I realized Kevin wasn't mentally ill. Kevin repeated from the back seat, You saw it! Yeah, uh, I don't know what I saw, but yeah, I saw it. Damn, Kevin. What the hell am I supposed to do with all of this? I can't go and tell my department that we both just saw a ghost, and that's why we need to reopen the case. I promise you that I will try to get your sister's case reopened, but you got to understand, I I can't just go rogue cop and hunt down her husband without probable cause first. And trust me, listing a damn ghost as my primary witness doesn't count as probable cause. While I sat there deep in thought planning my next move, Kevin leaned forward until the tip of his nose was touching the cage dividing us. His tone was soft yet filled with rage as he said, That's why I'm going to find justice for her and kill that son of a bitch myself. Kevin! See, when you say that crap, you put me in a really delicate position. I can either arrest you for making terroristic threats, or I can take you to the mental hospital, which keeps your arrest record clean and gives you time to cool down. I can't have somebody's blood on my hands. If you kill him, that's not justice, that's revenge note, although it doesn't sound right, Pennsylvania's criminal code terroristic threats do not relate to the traditional idea of terrorism. It's defined as somebody who communicates their intent to commit any crime of violence with intent to terrorize another. Case law has determined that a threat to hurt or kill someone constitutes terrorizing. 
but Kevin threw his back against his seat in protest. Listen, I'm going to look into this, but I, I can't just let you go free after you made those threats. I drove Kevin to the mental hospital with my stomach in knots the entire drive over. Nothing about this felt right, but it was the only way to keep everybody safe while I investigated further. Surprisingly, Kevin was pretty cooperative and didn't make a scene when we got to the hospital. Once he was checked in, I left and immediately called the one person I knew I could trust. Hey, uh, Tim, can you meet me at the gas station for coffee? I need your help with something. Sure thing. See you in 15. We grabbed our coffees and I listened to Tim complain about the weather for a good three minutes before I told him all about Kevin. Tim shook his head. Damn, Sean, you're like a trouble magnet. You know that, right? I glared at Tim. Yeah, thanks. But what the hell am I going to do? I mean, how am I supposed to convince Chief Fox to reopen this case? I sure as hell can't tell him the truth. Tim pulled out a pack of his cigarettes. He sat in his cruiser, puffing away at his cigarette while I sat in my cruiser directly next to his. I could tell he was deep in thought, so I waited. All right, I think I got it. Tim flicked a cigarette butt to the pavement. What? What do you got? I eagerly sat upright. We need to find the smallest piece of evidence that could suggest it wasn't a suicide. That's it, just a tiny shred of evidence, and I bet we can at least get permission to look into the case. I sat back into my seat with disappointment. You think I don't already know that? We don't have any other evidence besides a haunted house. What the hell, Tim? Tim pursed his lips as he thought a moment longer. Uh, oh, I got it. What? All right, so... About four years ago, we had that uh, that pipe leak in our evidence room. It contaminated almost all the DNA samples we had in that room. If you say that his brother is claiming he believes his sister was murdered and we have no evidence anymore to support otherwise, it's going to make the department look bad if he decides to make a big fuss about it. You know how much Chief Fox likes keeping his quiet around here. Just tell him to let you look into it to keep this crazy brother quiet. You are a genius, Tim. Tim held up both of his hands and shielded his face. Well, now this pretty face ain't free, no kissing here. I laughed and was so excited we found a way to get this case open back up. As soon as the shift ended, I stayed an extra hour to wait until Chief Fox came into the station and paid him a visit. Hey, uh, Chief, you have a minute? What do you want, Barkley? Ah, yes, the warm greeting I'm so used to. Last night, I got a CIT call for Kevin Watson. He was screaming about his sister's suicide actually being a murder and wanted to see hard evidence that proved otherwise. He was threatening to take his claims to the news, but ultimately, the call resulted with me taking him to the hospital. I was afraid that as soon as he was released, he'd call us again, so I tried to educate myself on his sister's suicide, and I looked for evidence from it, but well, there wasn't anything left in the evidence room. Somebody told me we had a pipe burst in there a few years back and we lost a lot of stuff in a mini flood because of cross-contamination. Well, what's your point? Right, uh, well, I was, I was hoping I could temporarily reopen Melissa Watson's death investigation, you know, to cover our tracks in, in case her brother tries to claim that we conducted an insufficient investigation. Chief Fox sighed as he swung his head up and stared at the ceiling. He covered his face with both of his hands and finally responded, I don't have time to deal with this crap. Do, do whatever you want, but make sure he doesn't cause a fuss. You're hearing me, Barkley? I don't want to deal with a town crazy that you couldn't handle. Thanks, Chief. I headed home and curled into bed with Howley, listening to her purr a lullaby as I fell asleep. I returned to work and grabbed Tim after roll call. We paid Kevin a visit at the hospital. I told Kevin what I told Chief Fox and apologized for lying about what he said. When I told him that I was ultimately able to reopen the case, though, he didn't seem to care what excuse I used to do it. I asked his consent to allow Tim and me to search his house, and he was more than happy to agree. I was walking out the door when Kevin added, I get it. You know why you brought me here? I don't agree with it, but I get it. You really are one of the good ones. Kevin's compliment really got to me. 
I felt so guilty for sending him there to save a killer's life. But if Kevin did go kill Melissa's husband, well, he'd ruin his own life. I knew I had to solve this murder and give Kevin his life back. Tim and I got to the house, and for the first time in days, the rain had let up. I got the spare key from where Kevin told me it was, and Tim and I tactically made entry. We searched the entire floor and then made our way to the basement. The basement was just a small cellar with several boxes stacked for storage. And then we made our way to the top floor. As we approached the front bedroom, Tim whispered, I swear to God, if I see a ghost, I might crap myself. For crying out loud, Tim, just follow my lead. I button hooked into the bedroom and lost my breath as I saw it. Flash. Her lifeless body fell to the floor, and the man lowered his gun and began to turn around. It took every muscle in my body to stop myself from firing my gun at the figure. As I began to see a bearded face, it vanished. I realized the breath that I had held throughout the entire thing. Holy, was that the flash of light you were talking about? Tim asked. Is that all you saw, just a flash of light? Uh, yeah. I don't know what the hell it was, though. You were right. It did look like a muzzle flash. Weird as hell. But what the hell's wrong with you? What'd you see? I, I saw it. I I saw her. Tim took a step back. Whoa. Are, are you serious? What the hell did you see, Sean? Tim. She was murdered. We headed over to the elementary school parked in the far back lot since we knew there wouldn't be anybody around in the middle of the night. Hold on a second. If everybody can see some sort of ghost when they go to that room, you, you think we should bring more men on scene and show them? We don't have to tell them beforehand, just let them experience it themselves. Tim's suggestion certainly wasn't that far stretched. I thought for a moment, I'm not sure if that's how this works. We need to test it with somebody else. Even you didn't see what I saw, you just saw a tiny piece of it. True. Maybe my dad can help us. Tim was good friends with my dad, and they worked on the force together before my dad retired a few years ago. I don't think you understand what retirement means, Tim smirked. I know damn well he will be excited to get back into the case, though. That guy does not know how to relax. I called my dad and he answered in a half-asleep tone. Hello, Sean. Everything all right? Yeah, Dad. Everything's fine. I'm sorry to wake you up, but uh, you think you could help Tim and me out with a case we're working on right now? My dad's tone immediately perked up. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Sounds urgent. Where can I meet you? Well, I'll pick you up in 20 minutes if that works. See you then. I hung up the phone and turned to Tim. Looks like we're about to put our theory to the test. Tim finished another cigarette before we made our way to my dad's house. We picked him up and I explained everything to him. I recently discovered just how much of an open mind my dad has when it comes to this stuff. After I recently discovered that he was madly in love with a woman who had psychic abilities. I watched as my dad's eyebrows raised and lowered and then as he twisted his mouth while he was digesting what I was describing. Finally, we pulled down the muddy lane and my dad simply said, All right then, let's do this. I didn't even put my car in park before I saw the flash of light through the window. Dad, you see that? See what? I sighed in disappointment. Never mind, come on. Tim, my dad, and I made entry into the house yet again. For safety, Tim and I did a quick search of the first floor and basement before we headed to the top floor. We walked up the stairs and I lead while Tim followed and then my dad. My dad nudged Tim and commented, You always let him go first? What? You want to run head on into some ghosts? Tim laughed as he replied. Shh! I motioned for them to get closer to me. I whispered, All right, it's going to be this room on the right. I want both of you to pay close attention and remember this isn't real. I walked towards the door and felt a wave of cold air sweep through me. My stomach flipped upside down at the same time that I saw it. Flash. I watched as the same woman pleaded. This time I could hear her. 
Just like Kevin described, I couldn't hear her out loud, but I could hear her in my mind, like replaying a memory. Her body heavily dropped to the floor, and I narrowed my vision on the man holding the gun. I was going to see his face this time. He slowly turned around and I started to see his beard. Then I saw his face. His eyes were black and he stared right through me and took my breath away. I tried to yell, but nothing came out. I froze. As soon as I blinked, the bearded man was gone. The woman was gone. I stared at an empty room with nothing more than a bed and a dresser. I spun around and I caught my breath. All right, what'd you guys see? My dad ran up to me and set his hand on my shoulder. Sean, you okay? I was still catching my breath. Yeah, I- I'm fine, Dad. What'd you see? I uh, saw nothing. What? How was that possible? Tim chimed in and added, I saw the flash of light again, but honestly, that's all I saw. I looked back at my dad and asked, Did you see the flash of light? My dad looked embarrassed as he shook his head. No, I didn't. I'm really sorry. I don't know what you two are talking about. Don't get me wrong. I believe you. I just don't see it myself. Damn it. I stormed down the stairs and toward my cruiser. Tim and my dad ran after me. Tim grabbed my elbow once we were outside. Whoa, Sean. Hey, why are you so pissed? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not mad at either of you. I- I'm pissed because how could I get anybody to believe me if I'm the only one seeing it? My dad gave me a hug and whispered, you know, I believe you. We'll figure this out. His hugs were like a blanket and comfort and sorrow somehow. I really believed him. We all headed home and I only spent a couple hours sleeping and woke up early enough to get some research done before work. I started Googling reliving and seeing the same events and eventually found myself on a website that discussed time loops. The exact definition is, a time loop or temporal loop is a plot device in which periods of time are repeated and re-experienced by the characters and there's often some hope of breaking out of the cycle of repetition. I did some more searching and I found that time loops aren't always experienced by everyone. One theory that jumped off that page at me was that time loops are only experienced by those who can change or fix them. So does this mean that Kevin and I are the only ones that can fix this? Possibly with a small amount of help from Tim to explain why he only sees part of it? My mind wandered a hundred different directions before I called Tim and told him what I found. Holy crap, you know what, that sounds exactly like what's going on. Tim's voice was still dry. I could tell he just woke up. Yeah, I know, listen, I'm going to need your help again tonight. Just meet me after roll call and I'll tell you my idea. After roll call ended, Tim met me outside at my cruiser. So, what's the plan, boss? Well, I need to see the full police report and autopsy report from the night Melissa died. Once everybody is out of the station, I want to go print off a copy. I didn't want to do it with everybody around because, well, you know how nosy this place can be. Tim laughed. (laughs) That's for sure. This place is worse than high school. We went inside and I printed out everything I needed to make an extra copy for Tim. We sat down in complete silence while we both read through the documents. After approximately ten minutes, I broke the silence. Do you see this autopsy report? No, I'm not there yet. I had to wait until Tim's slow butt caught up to me. What the hell? He finally responded. You see the comments about the bruises? Yeah. Again, what the hell? I mean, how wasn't that looked into? The autopsy report referenced several bruises around Melissa's arms, torso, and legs some that were new and some that were older. There was even a section that said she had recently broken a rib. I turned back through the police report and interviews. Nobody was ever asked about what caused these injuries. Then I checked the date stamp on the documents. The autopsy report was dated after all the interviews were conducted. The officers noted that a gunshot residue test was conducted and although they did not find any on her hand, They found some on her sleeve and concluded that maybe she had her sleeves pulled up over her hands when she pulled the trigger. I remembered the vision. Melissa stood there with her arms in the air, directly in front of the barrel of the gun. It was entirely possible that she was close enough to get some of the gunshot residue on her clothing after her husband fired the gun. 
Then I saw that the officers interviewed the neighbors, who all described Melissa and Andrew's marriage as happy with no problems. I found it odd that they didn't interview Kevin throughout this entire process. I flipped through a few more pages of the officer's notes from evidence and discussed with Tim a few of my concerns. Why do you think no one looked into this further, given all of her bruises showing signs of abuse? I asked. Tim shrugged. I didn't work this case, but if I had to guess, Peterson completed his interviews and investigation before he ever got back the autopsy report. Even though the medical examiner found bruises and a broken rib, since they weren't fresh, they didn't rule it as a homicide. Peterson probably took the facts on their face and closed it. Yeah, but all right, well, what about the gun? Tim and I both flipped through a few more pages until Tim found the section about processing the gun as evidence. It says the fingerprints were inconclusive on the gun. Damn it, we can't catch a break. I know. Let's keep thinking. I set the papers down. Well, maybe we're going at this the wrong way. The time loop is there to help us solve this and make it right. So what do we know from it? Tim replied, Flash a light woman pleading, and then a man with a beard. Did I miss something? I wet my lips out of habit as I thought for another moment. Yeah, the flash of light seems to be something important. Also, Kevin can see the time loop, too. Maybe we should go talk to him, see if he has something that can help us. Yeah, I agree. Tim and I headed to our cruisers and drove down to the hospital. It was still the middle of the night, but I told the nurse I had something urgent I had to discuss with Kevin regarding his sister's death. She woke up Kevin, and he came out to the main area to meet us. What's going on? Kevin was still in his pajamas and half awake. Hey, how's it going in here? I think I'm supposed to get out tomorrow as long as everything goes smoothly. So what's going on with the case? You find anything? Tim interrupted and asked, We need your help. Describe to us exactly what you remember seeing in that room each time. Kevin took a deep breath, held it in, and slowly released. All right, let's see. It starts when I see my sister plea for her life, and she says, Andrew, please, no, don't do this, I love you. And then I see Andrew pump the shotgun, and I hear a shell fall to the floor. And then he says, you just messed everything up. And that's when he fires the shotgun, and and I watch as she falls to the floor. And the vision ends when he turns around and I see his face. Tim looked confused. Wait, why would he pump the shotgun and a shell fell to the floor before he shoots it? Kevin looked surprised and shrugged his shoulders. Um, maybe he either fired the gun before the vision began, or, or maybe he forgot the gun was loaded and pumped it out of habit, I don't know. Uh, hold on. I dug into my side pocket and pulled out the rolled up documents that I printed earlier. I frantically flipped through the pages. Here. I slapped my finger against the paper. They only recovered one empty shotgun shell on the scene. Tim squinted his eyes as he digested what I was trying to say. So then, where the hell's the other shell? We're about to go find out. Tim and I got permission to come in early and search Kevin's house in the daylight. We arrived at his house and I was surprised to see the lights on inside. Tim and I went up to the house and knocked. Kevin answered the door. Hello, glad to see you guys. Kevin let us both inside and I asked, wow, you got out of there pretty fast, huh? Hey, you know, I really hated it in there, but I have to admit that I think it did some good to get out of this house for a few days. I haven't gone upstairs at all since I got home a couple hours ago. That's probably a good idea, I assured him. So, what's the plan? Tim looked over at me and responded. Well, Sean over here thinks we should go search for the mysteriously missing shotgun shell you saw Andrew rack and eject. Kevin's eyes glistened. I was hoping you'd say that. Let's do this. Whoa there. I interjected. Listen, Kevin, we'd love your help, but in order to keep the evidence as clean as possible, it'd be best if you stayed down here while we search the room. Damn. Yeah, all right, I get it. Yeah, you're right. I added, and I don't want to see you get your hopes up. 
You know, for all we know, Andrew picked up the second shell after the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, I know. The hope in Kevin's eyes began to slowly fade. By the way, I wanted to ask how much has changed upstairs since your sister passed. Is the furniture original or did you move your own stuff here? Well, the house was entirely under Melissa's name and she left it to me in her will because she was only married a year and never updated it to change it to Andrew. I'm not sure if she just forgot and never got around to it or if she intentionally wanted it to go to me. Anyway, I was in a bad spot and living in a trailer, so I barely had any furniture. Everything here is hers, except for my clothes and television, basically. Andrew didn't take much with him when he left. He spit on this place and said he never wanted to come back before he left town. Thanks. That helps. Tim and I made our way upstairs, and we cautiously stopped before we reached the front bedroom. Oh, I hate this part, I muttered. Tim shrugged. I just see a flash of light. Why don't you let me go first? Tim walked to the doorway and looked inside. He turned his head to the side and shielded his eyes. He was seeing the flash of light. He turned back towards me. Still just a flash of light to me, nothing else. I was next. I walked up to the doorway and peered into the room. Flash. I watched and listened as the same woman pleaded, Andrew, please, no, don't do this, I love you. Andrew pumped the shotgun, and I watched intently as the shotgun shell fell to the far corner and rolled under the bed. Andrew coldly growled, you just messed everything up. Flash. Melissa's lifeless body fell to the floor. Andrew turned around and stared right through me, and then he started walking right at me. I jumped back, blinked, and screamed. Tim caught me. Whoa, Sean, you're safe. You're all right. Everything okay? Kevin yelled from downstairs. I took a few breaths. Yeah, everything's all right, I responded. Tim, I, I saw more this time. I saw what Kevin described, and I saw the shotgun shell roll under the bed. I don't think Andrew ever picked it up. Oh, wow. Anything else you noticed? Well, there were, there were two flashes. I know I saw them before, but I think Andrew fired the gun before the vision starts. And that's the first flash. But he doesn't shoot her. That could also explain why he pumps the shotgun before shooting her. Tim's eyebrows lowered while he thought, well, if he fired the gun before he shot her, then where did he fire it? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Tim and I started searching the room, and we found no evidence of anything that was shot, and we had no luck finding the extra shell. We opened up all the drawers of the dressers, checking the ceiling, leaving no piece of furniture unturned. I went over to the mattress and decided to tear all the sheets off the bed. It wasn't even something I thought through, it was more instinctual. Tim quickly jumped in and started helping me. Then, in the top right corner, I saw a small hole. I took out my knife from my cargo pocket and sliced into the mattress. I got goosebumps at the feeling of accidentally making contact between my knife and the metal springs. I ripped apart the mattress until I found a tiny piece of shrapnel caught between the springs. It was a bullet. Son of uh, Tim, you see this? Tim leaned over to inspect the mangled bullet. Yeah, but that ain't no shotgun shell. No, it's a handgun bullet, maybe 9mm? Yeah, something close to that. Hard to tell, though. My brain kept turning. There must have been a second gun. That was the first flash of light. Tim's face lit up like a light bulb in his head. That explained it. But who shot the handgun? What if Melissa tried to shoot first? But then what happened to the gun? Why didn't she keep shooting? I'm not sure, but I'll tell you what, it's our job to find out. Let's keep looking for that shotgun shell, and then let's call CSI over here and process this bullet and get some pictures taken. We moved the bed out of the way and saw an old air duct cover that was missing a screw and only partially covered the air duct. Huh, I wonder... I took out my flashlight and shined it down the air duct. It shot straight down. Tim, I need you to walk downstairs and tell me where you hear a pinging sound in a minute. Um, all right. Tim complied and headed downstairs. I took a penny out of my pocket and dropped it down the air duct. Tim hollered up, 
Whatever you dropped sounded like it landed in the ceiling right above here. I ran downstairs and saw Tim standing in the family room, pointing up at the ceiling fan. Ah, damn. How are we going to search up there without tearing this place apart? Ah, you're thinking about this all wrong, buddy. Tim walked over to the hallway and pointed to a large air duct on the top of the wall. This should run straight across. If we open this intake up, we should have a straight shot through the rest of the ductwork on this floor. Kevin stared at us anxiously to see what we were up to. We borrowed a stepladder and revealed the intake. I shined my light down and was overwhelmed with the amount of dust and dirt. But then, about six feet away, I saw it. A shotgun shell. Holy! It's here! The shell is here! We called CSI and had them take away the shell and the bullet from the mattress. I explained everything to Kevin, and to my surprise, he had his own theory. My sister had a small 380 that our dad gave her years ago. She called it her lady gun. It's only a little smaller than a 9mm, but I never found her gun again. I just assumed Andrew took it when he left, but I wonder if she tried to shoot him in self-defense. I'm not sure what happened to it then, though. I took in Kevin's information and realized what was next. I guess our next step is to find that handgun. I'll have the conclusion to this story when Weird Darkness returns. After an entire day spent convincing Chief Fox that we needed to find Andrew and serve a search warrant on his residence to look for the gun, we finally got him to agree. It didn't take long for me to find Andrew's new hideout. About a year ago, he was arrested for DUI down in Virginia Beach. After many hours of playing phone tag with the Virginia Beach Police Department, we were able to work together and obtain the search warrant we needed. I briefed them on the case, except for, well, you know, the ghostly stuff and I requested that one of their primary officers live-feed me through the search so I could see what was going on. We made all the arrangements for the next day. I barely slept that night, I was so anxious. Poor Hallie barely got any sleep with all of my tossing and turning. She eventually jumped off the bed and finally got some sleep on the couch. I got dressed in my jeans and a t-shirt and grabbed my off-duty holster. Since all Tim and I were going to do was sit at the station today, there was really no need for me to put on my full uniform. I walked into the report writing room and found Tim already stationed in front of one of the computers with two hot coffees sitting on the counter. For me? I asked. Tim smiled and handed me the cup. Oh, you shouldn't have. You spoil me. Nah, I just like it when you owe me stuff, Tim teased. We logged on right at 0900 hours and I did a little happy dance when we got the live feed working. <laughs> yeah! I yipped in excitement. Even Tim couldn't contain his grin. I'm trying not to get my hopes up. I have no idea if they're going to find anything here. I know, I know. Thud. Thud. Virginia Beach Police Department, open the door. Tim and I sat in our chairs, hearts racing to see what would happen next. I felt like I had a front seat to a movie. The officer's radio mic turned on. Suspect. Ran out the back. I'm in foot pursuit. Ah, crap, Tim muttered. Our noses were nearly touching the computer monitor as we watched the bouncing image chase after Andrew. He was tackled and apprehended by one of the officers. We heard the mic turn back on. Watt in custody. By the way, in case any of you are wondering why he was detained and in custody, since there was no arrest warrant issued, there's case law in Virginia that states that if there is enough reasonable suspicion surrounding headlong flight upon police arrival of criminal activity that the suspect can be detained. You can check out Whitaker v. Commonwealth of Virginia. Well, foot pursuits are rarely more than just a minute long. It felt so short as I watched it, but as I thought back to my own previous foot pursuits, they all felt like I was running for over 10 minutes. I shook loose those thoughts from my head and 
focused back on the monitor. They went into the small condo and secured the scene. They meticulously searched room by room and didn't leave a single paper unturned. Nearly two hours went by before the excitement began. What the? The officer lifted up some type of technology software. He held it directly in front of the camera strapped to his chest. I hope you guys in PA are seeing this. As he held it up to the camera, I realized what it was. It was an external hard drive. More specifically, an external hard drive that was completely ripped to shreds. There's something on this thing that he didn't want anybody to find. But why the hell would he keep it? The officer was actually thinking out loud, knowing that we were unable to respond as this was a one-way live feed. The officer bagged the hard drive as evidence and continued the search. Another hour went by before there was more excitement. Tim and I heard a mumbled commotion in the background. Can you hear what they're saying? Tim asked. No, I can't. I turned up the volume, but it didn't help much. We moved to the edge of our chairs and held our ears against the computer speaker. Look what we got, boys! It blared into the speakers and forced Tim and I to simultaneously jump back into our seats. The camera spun in a circle, and then we saw it. The gun. It matched Kevin's description of Melissa's 380, and a quick confirmation of the serial number proved it was the one we were looking for. Yes! I jumped out of my seat and wrapped my arms around Tim, not even thinking about it. Holy crap! We found it! Tim was in disbelief as well. The officers bagged the gun as evidence, and after finding a small amount of cocaine in Andrew's condo, they arrested him for possession to help buy us time. Ballistics reports are never fast, but I was hoping Virginia Beach police could call in their technology specialists to see if they could recover anything on the hard drive. Patience is not my specialty. I sat on pins and needles for hours waiting on a call from the technology specialists. Tim and I had been at the station nearly 10 hours by this point. Finally, I got the call. Officer Barkley? Yeah, uh, hey, what do you guys have down there? I could hear the voice on the other end take a long breath. It isn't pretty. It, it took us a while, but we were able to recover some images and videos off of the hard drive. Well, uh, what were they of? I heard a long, deep breath. <sighs> Children pornography. All of it. I had the call on speakerphone and I watched Tim's face fill with anger. Nobody likes perps that are into kitty porn, but Tim had a sore spot for it after a call from a few years back that my dad told me about. The technology specialist continued, I made copies and uh, I can send them to you to review. Yeah, please do. Thank you. Was there anything else? Oh yeah, there were fragments of an unknown metal. I know this isn't my job to speculate, but I think it could be fragments of a bullet like this guy shot the hard drive. Tim and I looked at each other. We didn't say a word because we both knew what the other was thinking. Was this what Melissa shot? I immediately called my police contact with the Virginia Beach Police Department and asked them if they were successful with obtaining an arrest warrant on Andrew for possession of child pornography in addition to the cocaine. They assured me everything went smoothly and that Andrew was locked in jail and wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. I turned to Tim. We got him on drugs and child porn, but we aren't out of the clear on getting him for Melissa's murder. Yeah, but Sean, I don't know if we'll ever get the evidence for that. You know he's going away for years with that child pornography charge. Yeah, but that isn't justice. It's just settling. I promised Kevin we were going to get justice. Tim shook his head in defeat. All right, you're not going to settle. How am I not surprised? I pulled up the files that technology had sent over to see what exactly was on the hard drive. The photographs were hard to look at, but we had to look for any clues. Then we moved on to the videos. There was one of a young girl with a pink dress in a room that looked familiar, but I couldn't put my finger on where I knew it from. We watched a few moments longer until Tim recognized the room. Wait, I know where that is. Tim leaned in closer. You see that? That's the basement of Kevin's house. He was right. What if Melissa 
found what Andrew was doing in their basement and filming. We need to get the feds involved at this point. I mean, look at all of this. Tim agreed, and we both knew Chief Fox would not be happy with turning this into a federal investigation. I was tired and in desperate need for sleep. Let's just swing by Kevin's to tell him what's going on, and then we can call it a night. Tim and I drove together to Kevin's. So what news do you have for me? Kevin eagerly asked. I told him about the gun and the hard drive recovered at Andrews. I also told him about what was on the hard drive. At the exact moment that I told Kevin about the little girl in the pink dress, I heard a little girl giggle. Shivers shot down my spine. Did you guys just hear that? Hear what? Tim asked. Neither Tim nor Kevin heard it. I followed the voice into the basement and the giggling stopped. Shh, he's coming. The hushed whisper spoke from directly behind me. The basement door slammed shut and I saw a bearded man walk down the stairs. It was another time loop. Why are you covered in blood? The little girl asked. Shut up and go back to your corner, Andrew hissed. He walked over to the basement shower in a hurried mania and rinsed himself off. In the blink of an eye, I was staring at an open basement door and surrounded by complete silence. I glanced over to the lone toilet and shower. In this part of Pennsylvania, they built basements with toilets and showers for coal miners and steel workers to clean off before entering the main part of their homes. Tim! I screamed. We need to get a CSI back down here and check this drain for DNA. CSI arrived on scene and took swabs from the basement drain. As the technician reached the cotton swab deep into the drain, she looked at me and asked, So why exactly did you call us back out here? We were just out here and you never mentioned swabbing this drain then, so why now? Oh, you know, because I saw a ghost take a shower. <laughs> no, I was not going to say that. Instead, I settled on, I thought I saw some stains in there when I shined my flashlight down inside. The technician rolled her eyes and lifted the cotton swab back out from the drain. Well, I'll be damned, she whispered. We might just have some blood. She took out her black light and the entire drain lit up like Christmas lights. A grin formed across my face. Yes. The technician finished taking samples and I thanked her for making the trip back out. I went back upstairs and met with Tim and Kevin. What'd they find? Kevin asked. Looks like there were traces of blood in the drain, but we don't know whose blood it is until the test results come in, and those usually take a couple of weeks, if not months. Well, what are we going to do in the meantime? I mean, what's the next step? I sat down and took a moment to gather my thoughts and began to walk through the case with Kevin, not just for his sake, but also for mine. Well, let's see what we have. As far as hard evidence goes, we have Andrew on charges of child pornography. Now, that part of our case is being shipped off to the FBI to try and track down who the little girls were in those videos and figure out where they are now. now the hard drive looked like it was shot, and I put my money on guessing that's what Melissa shot that day that Andrew got so angry and murdered her for. Sadly, though, I'm not sure how if we will ever get to prove that. The shotgun shell that I found, it's the exact same kind as the one found on the scene of Melissa's death. The gun we found at Andrews came back positive to being Melissa's. It'll take some time, but I'll guess the bullet fragments found in the mattress, they'll also match the kind used in that gun. We have enough probable cause to suggest that it wasn't a suicide, but I'm, I'm still not convinced we have Andrew for it until these test results come back. And how long did you say that'll be again? Kevin sounded more nervous now as he asked. Weeks, maybe months. I'm sorry, people always watch television and crime shows and think these things can be solved overnight, but they can't. They, they take time. Kevin sat in silence for a long moment. I understand. You sure? He didn't look like he was all right with what I said. Yeah. Tim glanced over at me as if to say he's pissed. All right, well, we're going to get going now. Just try to get some rest, and I'll stop back with the results as soon as we have them. Kevin, we have him. I know we're going to get him for Melissa's murder, so just be patient. Thanks for everything, officers. 
Kevin shook our hands and walked us to the front door. We headed back to the station and started to prepare what we wanted to ask Andrew during our interview with him. Throughout the entire process, I had yet to question Andrew about any of this. After a few hours, Tim and I agreed that we had a good foundation of what we needed to ask Andrew. We got to the jail, and I requested that they brought Andrew out to the interview room. The deputy sheriff walked around the desk and typed a few things into their computer. Uh, but, uh, he, he isn't here. Tim and I looked at each other wide-eyed. What do you mean he isn't here? Where is he? The deputy sheriff clicked his mouse a few times. Uh, he, he was released on bail. What? How is it somebody can be arrested for such a terrible crime and immediately get released on bail? If you were in the federal system, this would never happen. But since we served local arrest warrants on him, then he came to the local jail first. I finally mustered enough words together and all I could say was, this isn't right. Tim and I headed back out to our cruiser and started to track down Andrew so that we could still interview him. Even though he wasn't in jail, that didn't mean that we couldn't talk to him. We got a local motel room number from his paperwork at the jail where he listed the address for where they should send the letter for his court date to. I realized we hadn't eaten anything all day, so we briefly stopped to grab some food before we continued to the motel. What room was he? Tim asked. Six. Three, four, five, here it is. Tim motioned to the number on the door. I glanced at the lock and saw the door was slightly ajar. I silently motioned Tim to get ready as I pushed the door open. Short wall, I said. Holy. Tim's jaw dropped. What, what, what the hell do you see? Um, long wall, covered in blood. So much blood. Enter on me. Tim entered the room, and I immediately button-hooked and followed. Blood. Everywhere. Laying on the bed was Andrew's lifeless body. Despite the obvious signs of death, I checked for a pulse with negative results. Damn. We cleared the small motel room, checking in closets and the bathroom to ensure no one else was still there. I clicked my mic. 1034 to dispatch. Dispatch, go ahead. We have one deceased on scene. Send medics to pronounce. I also need additional units to secure the scene and start CSI. Time for. Then I saw the motel's notepad setting on the nightstand with something written on it. It said, Officer Barkley, sometimes revenge is also justice. Tim and I secured the scene and we called for a CSI. As Tim wrapped the caution tape around the front of the apartment, I asked him if he saw the note on the nightstand. No, what note? Well, come here and look. Tim came back into the room and I pointed across the room at the end table. Where's the note? Tim asked. It's right there, that notepad. Tim picked up the notepad and held it in front of his face, turning to show me the front. It's blank. There's nothing on it. That's not right. It was just... I trailed off as I ran up to him and started looking around for the note. It was nowhere. I held up the notepad Tim had in his hand to see if I could still see the indentation from having been written on it. Nothing. Sean, what note are you talking about? I told Tim about the note and what it said. Neither one of us had any explanation for what happened to it. Before we could even speculate, CSI and detectives arrived on the scene. Tim and I helped process the evidence. First, CSI photographed the entire motel room and the body. There was a gun laying on the bed next to Andrew that I secured and logged as evidence. I ran the serial number and found the gun was registered to Andrew. CSI checked Andrew's hands for any gunshot residue and it came back positive. Andrew definitely fired the gun. A short while later, forensic investigators arrived from the medical examiner's office and began their process of collecting evidence and removing the body. Tim and I headed to the motel's main office to review the surveillance footage. We rewound the recording until we saw Andrew arrive at his room. I watched as he entered the room and swung the door behind him. It softly bounced back slightly, explaining why it wasn't shut the entire way. We sat for several minutes watching the screen, but nothing moved. I played the footage at two times the speed until we saw movement again. Hold it right there, Tim yelled. I know, I know. I rewound the footage slightly and hit play. Wait, that's... 
Wait, did we miss it? Tim and I were both confused. We were watching ourselves enter Andrew's motel room. Tim added, We must have missed it. Go back. We watched the footage all over again and still saw nothing. Uh, maybe somebody was already in the room waiting for him? I theorized. Smart. Keep going back then. Tim and I ended up spending nearly two hours watching all the footage from the time that Andrew first checked in and his trips in and out of his room. He only left his room twice, so there wasn't much to watch. We were perplexed as to how somebody got into the room and could have shot him. What about through the window? Tim suggested. We went around back and looked at the window to the motel room. There were bars on the windows. There was no way someone could have fit through those. While we tried our hardest to grasp at ideas of how somebody got into his motel room, we met back with the forensic investigators, CSI, and detectives in room 6. So, what's it looking like in here? Any good leads? I asked. One of the detectives came over to us. Hey guys, this is definitely looking like a suicide. Medical examiner should confirm it tomorrow. What? What do you mean it's a suicide? She looked offended, as she should. I was accusing her of not doing her job correctly. I mean that this was a suicide. He has gunshot residue on his left hand. We confirmed he was left-handed. We could tell by the entry wound that he held the gun against his left temple and shot himself. He was the only one staying at this entire motel, so no one heard the gunshot. Assuming you guys didn't see anyone come into this room on the video footage, then this had to have been a suicide. Crap. This case just gets more confusing with every step. Tim and I left the scene and got into the cruiser together. All right, you want to call it out or should I? Tim asked. I will. I held down my mic. 1034 to dispatch. Go ahead. Show myself and 1045 heading to extracted for a follow-up with Kevin Watson. We got to Kevin's and Tim nearly shook the house with his knock. Kevin came to the front door. Oh, you guys sound serious with that knock. What's going on? What the hell, Kevin? I yelled. Why would you do that? Kevin backed up and his eyebrows raised. He held up his hands in defense. Hey, hey what, what are you talking about? What, what did I do? Don't mess with us, Tim roared. You shot Andrew. We just found him. Kevin did a good job at looking surprised. A Andrew's dead? I was both angry and confused by Kevin's reaction. Tim's anger only grew. Don't act stupid with us. We know what you did. Sean here tried to help you and bent over backwards to try and keep you from doing something this stupid, and then you go and run behind our back and murder him. Kevin pleaded his innocence. Well, I promise I did not kill Andrew. I've been home this entire time. Wait, wasn't he in jail? How could I have killed him? Kevin really was doing a good job at acting dumb. I slowly started to believe him. You mean to tell me that you've been home all day? Yeah, I, I swear. Kevin's tone grew higher. He was getting nervous. Can you prove it? I asked. Kevin thought for a moment. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't have any security cameras here. You, you can track my, my phone or, or car or, or whatever. I shook my head. How would I know you didn't just leave them here and get there another way? Kevin became concerned. I swear I didn't kill Andrew. I appreciate and respect you too much. I know how hard you've been working to seek justice for Melissa's death. Wait, Kevin announced. I was just playing some video games. You could talk to the guys I was playing against. I played for several hours. Tim didn't know how to work the Xbox, so I logged in and had Kevin point out which users he played against. I called all of them and each one verified Kevin's story and gave me the same description of what they played and what happened while they played and who won. All the stories lined up. I don't know who the hell killed Andrew then. Investigations are saying he committed suicide, but… I trailed off as I wasn't sure I should even tell Kevin about the note. But what? N nothing. Never mind. I changed the topic. Have you seen any more visions since you've been back? Uh, no, I haven't seen anything. I even went upstairs and nothing happened. 
and I was curious to test this out myself, so I decided to venture upstairs. I took a deep breath and approached the front bedroom. I turned the corner and looked inside the room. Nothing. I exhaled and closed my eyes. Oh, thank God. I opened my eyes again and saw Melissa standing in front of me. She slowly grinned and raised her hand palm up in front of her. She continued to raise her hand, held it to her head, and snapped. The room spun around so fast that it felt like a -a tilt-a-whirl. Now I was facing Andrew, tears in his eyes as he slowly raised a gun to his temple. He pleaded, No, I don't want to die! Please, stop! How is this happening? He started to sob. Flash. The room spun around again, and I thought I was going to get sick. I stood facing Melissa and watched the haunting grin return to her face. Without physically moving, her figure rushed forward and stood directly in front of me. I could feel the cold air drifting off of her and through my body. Revenge is also justice, she whispered. I could barely breathe, but when I tried, I could see my breath in front of me. My body was frozen. I blinked and she was gone. The room stood still. I no longer saw my breath. Melissa. She killed Andrew. I ran downstairs and told Tim and Kevin what I just saw. Kevin had a hard time accepting it, but at the same time, he said that he wasn't surprised. Melissa was always so passive with Andrew throughout her life, it actually brought him some peace in some twisted way to see her in such control in the afterlife. Tim and I left and got dressed back into our street clothes at the station. We headed out to a bar to recap our cluster of a week. I am done with this crap. I released the words from my chest as I downed my beer. You did a good job, kid. Thanks, Tim. What the hell did I really do? Andrew won't ever go to trial. All the kids he hurt are going to be investigated by the FBI. And, well, the FBI is going to be the heroes who figure out what happened to those kids not me. Like, what was all of this even for? Sean, listen to me. You saved Kevin from himself, and you're the reason the FBI has that case now. You saw all those visions because Melissa didn't want you to solve her murder. She wanted you to expose Andrew and the truth before she sought her own revenge. She wasn't going to rest until he was exposed and dead, but she couldn't expose him for the monster he truly was. I patted Tim on the shoulder. You're a good guy, Tim, you know that? Ah, shucks. You're just saying that so I'll pay you for the next round. Hey, if you're offering. Tim ordered us another round of drinks and we slowly drifted our minds away from this week's chaos and started to get back to our normal life once again. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please tell someone about it. Recommend Weird Darkness to your friends, family, and co-workers who love the paranormal, horror stories, or true crime like you do. Every time you share the podcast with someone new, it helps spread the word about the show, and a growing audience makes it possible for me to continue doing the podcast. Do you have a dark tale to tell of your own? Fact or fiction, click on Tell Your Story on the website and I might use it in a future episode. Creepypasta stories are fictional in nature, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Candles was written by Andrew Pendragon. Old Woman in the Window was written by weirdo family member Randy Hogan. And I'm a Cop and I Institutionalized Someone I Knew Wasn't Crazy was written by S.F. Barkley. Weird Darkness Theme by Alibi Music. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. James 3, verse 10. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. And a final thought. Never let a bad situation bring out the worst in you. Be strong and choose to be positive. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.
the political season is upon us, and those flying the red collars have their promises, the politicians wearing blue have different promises, but those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you, so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does, so he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts.